<clears throat> okay, so I'm going to do this a little bit differently. Since I do the spatial presentation in my sleep, my wife complains. She doesn't want to know any more about points, lines, polygons, geometry collections, or the new curve types on the full globe. Um, she says she knows everything from my sleep talking. So what I'm going to do is actually start out with a little bit of a demo. And then we're going to go into the presentation per se. And this will kind of stimulate you. Uh, those of you who do not know anything about SQL Server Spatial will come out with lots of questions. Hopefully, this will be the answer. Uh, it will pre be presented in the, um, uh, the presentation. And for those of you who know it, you can simply say, ooh and ah. OK, so first of all, I've got the GeoNames database loaded up here. Uh, everybody know GeoNames? Anybody not know GeoNames? Raise your hand. GeoNames is a 7 million plus um, public domain database of points of interest. And it's maintained in Europe, and you can add to it yourself. In fact, uh, there's an API, and you can go put points in in your local neighborhood and so on. It's an actually very useful data, data set uh, that you may want to investigate, GeoNames. So what I'm going to do here is I've loaded this up into SQL Server, and I'm going to simply to show you that it's real. We're going to select count star. If I can type, hello, from, hello, geo names. And now I'm going to execute that. And at the bottom of my screen, how do I scroll here, Dan? Oh, just uh, move the mouse. Oh, this is not going to be good, Dan. There you go. There we go. So uh, we've got 1.8, almost 1.9 million objects here. OK, we're going to zoom back in here so you can see what I'm doing. I'm getting this, huh? Move the mouse. Go up. Go up. Go up. Oh, 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 it's really easy. Almost you didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. However, I'm going to get sick here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, instantiate a couple of objects. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to declare a new variable. I'm going to call it at p for at point. Uh, I'm going to make it of type geography, which is my favorite type. At the end of the day, if we ask that secret question, what is Ed's favorite spatial data type out of geometry and geography, it is going to be geography. And we'll explain why. And we're going to set that equal to um, a, a new point object. So we're going to come up and declare this with a static method, geography. And we are going to make it of type point. And we're going to make it. Um, Latitude of 38 minus 120, which is close to where I live, um, and 4326. And outside of Steve and Chris and a few spatial guys, you're not included either. What does 4326 mean? Anybody know? Hmm? Geospatial reference system? Geospatial reference system? Yes. E EPSG? 4326 is WGS84, our favorite uh, uh, datum, right? Um, OK, so there we've actually uh, got a point object. And I can actually execute that. And if I execute that, that's great. Works. So what does that mean? Nothing yet. So I'm going to come over here at the end. And I'm now going to buffer this. So I'm going to create a spatial buffer. And I'm going to use ST buffer. Anybody know what ST means? Kind of the context here? It's a standards compliant. It means spatial temporal. We haven't got to the temporal yet. So this is an OGC or ISO 19125 standard method for buffer. We also have non-standard methods. And I'm going to buffer this with 10,000 meters. Now, I'm using a spherical coordinate system, but I'm using a linear reference, right? So this is a linear unit, meters. But I'm dealing with spherical coordinates because this is a completely integrated um, geospatial type. We're dealing with the Earth as a unit sphere, a closed surface. So I'm computing in latitude and longitude spherical coordinates, ellipsoidal coordinates, but I'm doing it in a way that I can do distance measure, area measure, and so on in linear units. And that's all specified in that EPSG 4326 specification. OK, so with that, I need to zoom out just a little, back a little. OK, and now I'm going to add a new line down here. And we're actually going to do something with that. So now what we have is an object. And what is that object? It's a point on the Earth. And it's buffered to 10 kilometers, right? 10,000 meters. All right. So with that, I'm now going to select a bunch of these objects from um, the GeoNames database. So I'm going to say select star from 
uh, geonames, where, and this is where it gets interesting, right? At P, that buffer object, right? Dot ST, there's ST again, intersects. And what am I going to intersect? I'm going to intersect my column of geography in that geonames table. And since this is a Boolean operation, I'm going to test for true equals 1. And I'll grab all of those. And I will execute. And it's done. Here it is. OK, so that's pretty cool. And uh, if I go down here and I hit uh, spatial results, and notice that we're in SQL Server Management Studio. SQL Server Management Studio has a spatial results tab. So when it detects either a geometry or a geography type being returned, it presents a map here. It's a very simple map. It's actually the same map control that you find in the SQL Server reporting services, which we'll mention a little bit later. And it just gives us kind of um, a programmer level validation that we've done the right thing. But notice we've got a hover over, and we can actually take a look over here. Here's Wet Meadows Spring. Uh, it has alternate names. There's this latitude and longitude. We can come over here and do the same thing. Now, if any of you were to look closely at this, you'd notice something a little unusual. Has anybody noticed anything slightly unusual about my database server here? Well, unusual, let me just say this. The database server, in this case, is not residing on my machine. Where is it? It's Azure. This is SQL Azure I'm in. And in fact, this is the Chicago data center that's delivering up all this data. Well, that's pretty cool, huh? So we've got the same types in SQL Server, the Enterprise Edition, or the Express Edition, or SQL Azure for free or hosted in the cloud. It all works the same. It all works in SQL Azure. In fact, if I scroll my mouse over, boy, I really kind of like this, Dan. It just goes to show you can teach old dogs new tricks. So take a look over here. There it is. There is my Azure instance. Here is an R2, SQL Server 2008 R2 instance. And here is the new Denali CTP1 instance uh, residing. And these upper two are on my machine. But I chose to use the Azure instance just to give you guys a little bit of a feel for SQL Server Spatial in the cloud. It's all the same. Back to my mantra, which is spatial isn't special. OK, which people who know me say, why do you say that? Because it isn't. It's just another data type. OK, let's zoom back out here a little bit so I can figure out what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to cancel that. And now I'm going to show you one more demo, and then we'll go into the presentation. Now, this is an example here of a um, third-party application. This is actually written by Esri, ESRI. Esri, I still am a, this will be my 26th consecutive ESRI user conference. So I like to say, ESRI, but now they've officially branded it Esri, so we will say Esri. Um, this is actually their Silverlight um, uh, SDK, and it's uh, all written in .NET. And this is a real departure for Esri because they have been a common C++ company in the past, but they are now writing applications specifically for Azure, and this is all done in managed code. Uh, this particular one, um, we can actually take a look at their architecture over here real quickly. And if I hit my, my Zoom button right, we can come take a little bit of, of a look about how they do it. Everything is done in Azure here. So the Bing Maps are coming from, obviously, Bing Maps. Um, but all of the data is stored in SQL Azure. And what do we have here? We have all the US census uh, uh, tracked block groups for the US. And what are we going to do with this? We're simply going to do a very simple application. I'm going to zoom back out. And we're going to pick up a select features. And this is all done in Silverlight. I'm going to draw my Silverlight polygon. This is going to be interpreted by something we're going to emphasize a little bit later. And this is the SQL Server Spatial Library. So not only do we have SQL Server with SQL types and method and indexing support, we also publish and make available a free managed and unmanaged library. 
And that library is going to be used here to serialize that Silverlight object into a SQL Server type. And it's then going to do an ST intersects against about 40,000 polygons sitting out in SQL Azure and then return the results back as Silverlight vectors. And with a little luck, of course, this was working perfectly wirelessly a minute ago. But you guys got to love demos. And it isn't going to work now, is it? Let's see if the drive time polygons work. So I don't seem to have. It's, I just tested on my machine. It's, what it's working on your machine. But why isn't it working on my machine? Well, just suffice it to say, it does work. I actually provide the URL. It has worked for me every time before. It works on Steve's wirelessly. Uh, you know what I'll do is I'll take out my wired connection, throw it away, and uh, refresh. Aha. There we go. There's, there's the problem. Well, we're not going to spend any time on that. But suffice it to say, it does work. Steve just proved it. Uh, thank you, Steve. OK. And what's the URL for that? I, I actually have it in my presentation. And okay. the, the URL, um, I'll, um, uh, you can get from that. Anyway, so let's go here. And we can go into my presentation. So anyway, um, note my email address down here, ed.catabotmicrosoft.com. <coughs> You know, please contact me if you've got questions from the simple. There is no such thing as a dumb question. Uh, I've asked many of them, so I respond to anything now with politeness. So ask the dumb questions. I do not mind. Like, what is SQL Server Spatial? Why did you do this? How come you did not do that? Um, so there we go. Now, here's my brief slide. Sometimes when I talk to execs, they say, you've got 15 minutes and one slide to show me. So you divide them up into four, and then you, you know, <laughs> present as fast as you can. I'm thinking about going to 16 slides next. Um, but what is SQL Server Spatial? Two data types. How did we do that? They are CLR UDTs, all right? Comprehensive set of spatial methods. We've got high performance spatial indexes. We've got industry standard support. Um, we have a spatial library, like I told you before. In, in that spatial library, we have sync and builder APIs. Uh, we have management studio, studio integration, and you've just seen cloud enablement. Okay, specifically, what is it? It is not 3D. It is not raster. This is currently 2D vector support. That doesn't mean the object model can't do more. The object model itself is a typical OGC object model, X, Y, or latitude, longitude, Z, and M. We also have SRID as part of the objects. A little unusual. Anybody name the other relational database that does it the same way, when, where the SRID is part of the uh, spatial object model? PostGIS. You're right, PostGIS. That is correct. That's another good buddy of mine, Paul Ramsey, who does PostGIS uh, on the Postgres platform. Great platform, by the way. Um, so simple feature support for um, uh, with OGC. All the major vendors support us, so we've got implementations. You can pick up MapInfo, you can pick up Esri, you can do Autodesk, Intergraph. Um, it is a standard feature in all SQL Server editions. You cannot buy or even get a free copy of SQL Server without spatial support. It's there from um, Express all the way through Data Center version of SQL Server, all the way out to, to uh, Azure. Um, we also support something rather unusual. We support very large spatial objects. What's the largest single spatial object we can support? Anybody know? Remember it's CLR, UDTs? How big can UDTs be? Two gigabytes. So a single spatial object can be two gigabytes in size. I doubt that any of us in this room, myself included, have access to a machine big enough to handle a two gigabyte individual spatial object. You would need a a massive machine to do that. But suffice it to say, you can handle a lot. Maximum number of holes in a polygon. Anybody have an idea what uh, it is for SQL Server Spatial? 64,000. That's right. You can have 64,000 holes in a two gigabyte object if you were so inclined to do. All right? Um, hopefully not. Right, here's a stupid question. What, sure. What do you mean by a hole? What do I mean by a hole? You have outer rings and inner rings. So for instance, think of the country of South Africa. South Africa has a hole in it. The hole is the country of Lothoso. 
Okay, that's a hole. That's an inner ring. Outer rings, inner rings. So we can have we could have 64,000 lithosos inside a two gigabyte highly articulated South Africa object if we w were so inclined. Um, we are also supported in SQL Server reporting services using this same drawing engine that we have inside of SQL Server Management Studio. It's very simple. It's not designed to be complex. It is designed simply to provide, uh, I would call it, rudimentary spatial rendering. OK, details. And we'll go into this a little bit more. But we have a geography type for geodetic data. And we have a planar type for planimetric data. Planimetric data is what we often think of as projected data, something in UTM coordinates or in uh, a state plane coordinate system. We also treat the Earth as a singular closed surface objects in which there are no edges. There is no, you can't fall off the edge of the world at the anti-meridian or off at the poles. Um, this causes lots of client software, lots of grief, because almost all geographic system vendors believe the world is flat. And I'm here to tell you, it's not flat. OK. Uh, and remember, what's my favorite data type? Geography, Geography thank you. OK, we've got all the standard methods in here. So if you go to the OGC spec, um, you know, the planar type supports all of the OGC methods. The geodetic type, geography, supports most of them. Why don't we support all of them? Because we can't. Because the OGC specification, even though it says open geospatial, actually they believe the Earth is flat also. And I'm here to tell you that the Earth is round. So this is kind of this evangelistic zeal that I bring to this because the majority of the legacy of thinking in geospatial has been the Earth is flat. There are edges. There are singularities. But they're really not. So OGC still suffers from this. And consequently, our geography type is 99% compliant. But it cannot get to that last 1% because of issues um, surrounding the definition that OGC imposes um, on simple features. OK, um, we have standard format support. So we can turn out well-known text. So you could, for instance, say ST as text. And boom, coming out um, of the definition up there. In fact, we could do that if I were adroit enough. But I'm scared now with the uh, zoom control that Dan put on there for me. Um, but we could put out either WKT, WKB, well-known binary. Um, and it looks like I actually have a typo here, first time I've seen that. Uh, and then we can do geographic markup language, GML. All right. Additionally, since this is a CLR UDT, and we'll explain this later, you could even write your own new function to turn out KML, for instance, if you wished. We can also have something rather unique. We can have multiple spatial indexes per column. In fact, we can have 249 spatial indexes per column. And then you run out. But that should give you enough spatial indexes. Um, you can have multiple geometry or geography columns per table. This is something that causes our poor friends at Esri a lot of grief, because they expect to see one geometry or geography table or uh, column in a table. We can have up to 1,023. Why 1,023? Because SQL Server has a limitation of 1,024 uh, columns in a single database table. But we like to have a primary key. Why do we like to have a primary key? So we can build a spatial index. So minus 1 gives us 1,023 <laughs> potential spatial columns per table. Hopefully, none of you will stretch that limit. Um, we can create new CLR spatial functions that I just talked about using the Sync and Builder APIs. And again, I want to reemphasize this. The spatial library, the thing that makes it possible to have SQL Server spatial is freely distributable. And at the very end of the presentation, which uh, Jan will provide to all of you, is a resources slide. And on that, it actually lists where you can get that. But it's a feature pack. It's a SQL Server feature pack. It's way down the list of feature packs. And um, in fact, Steve uses that library in the data connector that he just showed you. ESRI uses it in um, that product that I tried to show you just a second ago that Steve got working. Um, Safe Software. How many of you know Safe Software, FME, Feature Manipulation Engine? Uh, they use that built in. It's freely redistributable. We don't charge Safe, ESRI, or Steve to include that. You can redistribute that at will. 
Um, and then, of course, SQL Azure Spatial. OK, now let's go into the spatial types. Now, I'm going to call these subtypes. They're actually listed in the OGC hierarchy as types. But what we do is we have two types, geometry and geography, and we support all these subtypes or classes for each one. Some of them are new to SQL Server Denali. Denali is our latest and greatest. If SQL Server 10 is out today, which is SQL Server 2008, SQL Server 11, which will probably be called SQL Server 2011 when it ships probably by the end of the year. Notice a few weasel words in there because we haven't actually committed to a ship date. Um, and, but it's available as a CTP for free download today. Some of those, such as compound curve, circular string, curve polygon, will be available in Denali only. I mean, excuse, yeah, yeah. In SQL Server 2008, we've got the more typical point, line string, polygon, multi-polygon, multi-point. Those are our standard um, uh, just subtype or class support. But this gives us now a rich set of classes in which to program against. OK, so now let's talk a little bit more detail here about our spatial types. Again, as we mentioned, geometry, computations in the plane, infinite or projected workspace. You can just keep going in any direction. The trouble is, is that once we start using spatial coordinates, we deal now with a finite plane. Geography, on the other hand, computations in the ellipsoid. Our workspace is a round workspace, right? So this is just, I'm going to fly through with some of these. I've, the deck is actually quite large. I think there are 62 slides in it. There's no way I'm going to get to all of them in this presentation. But I wanted to leave this with you so that you could, at your leisure, when you're not doing anything else this weekend, uh, you could then review the deck. I have a few hidden slides in here on spatial indexing. And uh, I'm not even going to go into all of that detail here today. Did I see a question back here? OK. Yes. In the spatial index itself, do we support clustered or non-cluster non -cluster. indexing? Yeah. Well, let's see here. Um, we typically use a clustered index primary key, right? Mm -hmm. But the spatial index itself is not clustered. So it only uses um, you know, the spatial column that you have indicated. So you can't have multiple, spa multiple columns, like, for instance, a geometry column and uh, a name column indexed together in the spatial index. I suspect that's what you mean, correct? No, actually, I was wondering like, if we are using any of the spatial as being the cluster so that the entire table gets rearranged uh, for better performance. Uh, but since, uh, as you're saying, primary queue becomes more of a cluster, then spatial would be of obviously become non-cluster. Yep. You can't have to. Here's a little techie trick. If you want really good cold cache spatial index performance, which we often do in, the, in, the, in cloud environments, what you do is you build your clustered index with, let's say, a primary key. Let's say we have an ID field, right? ID field is unique. And we could build a um, primary key on that ID field. Or you could persist with computed columns, the latitude and the longitude, and you could go ID persisted latitude, persisted longitude, make that as the clustered key, right, primary key. And now when you make that as the, the, the primary key, then when we work against the um, spatial index, you now have a clustered index in which it's ordered by latitude and longitude. Yeah. And so consequently, it doesn't have to do any lookups against a fragmented primary key, it is actually spatially ordered, and you get the same performance in a cold cache that you get in a warm cache. Yep. There's mm -hmm. your trick for the day if you mm -hmm. get my uh, drift. Another question is uh, regarding the DBA features like uh, replication, log shipping, does the spatial thing support in getting all the replication done? Because previously, the spatials, all the special cat, uh, data types were not supported in that, or blogs or anything, these are not supported in the... Uh, SQL replication, right? Um, are they supported in the new versions? They are. Mm -hmm. uh, replication and, and many of the features. Needless to say, it's very difficult, if you can imagine, when you turn out a new feature in a, in a database product, 
you can't, it's very hard to get support for all of the ancillary features until it's actually done. And we barely got our project in last time, to be perfectly honest. This was for SQL Server 2008. And so consequently, we made it to the very, very last release that was possible to get it into RTM. And so consequently, things like uh, replication support, those things typically go wanting until the next release or sub-release. Mm -hmm. So with Denali, we have cleaned up all kinds of, let's say, missing compatibility features okay. like that. And the question is like, and as you said, it is supported. Will the integration services will have a support for spatial? Because we are not able to do any transformations on uh, non-binary type. Which Here right is my bind. ask from you guys. If you like spatial, if you think spatial has potential, then things like SSIS, which does not and will not have spatial support, um, you need to go and go to connect, and you need to file your opinions on whether SQL Server Spatial should be supported in products like SSIS. Um, it is not easy to do because SSIS has its own data model and it actually has to be extended to support the spatial types. And right now we're low on the priority list, just like with OData. In OData we are relatively low on the priority list and you need to make your opinions known as to a couple of things. Is point support only good enough for OData? or is rich support of the SQL Server spatial types important? Um, so these are, are, it turns out in large companies like Microsoft, it all gets down to resources, timing, and priority, right? And spatial sometimes, while we find it very important for this room, there are, uh, let's say, other alternate thinking paths uh, that say that spatial isn't as important as uh, other features. So. SSIS, no. There is not going to be support and spatial for uh, SSIS. But if you wanted to use SSIS and you wanted to do um, a spatial ETL, what would you do today if you had that, if you, you needed that? Uh, we just passed on as a binary uh, across. We don't uh, query anything on that because we can't do any manipulations on the IIS. So we just pass on a binary blob, and then it goes to the destination. That's right. But if you had to do any transformations, we are uh, restricted, limited. But there right. is one product out there that does it. Who knows what that product is? It's an add-in to SSIS that brings full spatial ETL. Mike knows. FME. FME. Safe Software's Feature Manipulation Engine, oh, FME. FME. And FME comes in two flavors. It comes in an enterprise flavor in which you can use uh, FME as a plug-in to SSIS. And it brings a plethora now of new transformations. It actually makes SSIS, from my standpoint, look really interesting. Um, and what do they do? You know, they actually have to wrap up the objects in, in uh, bar binary maxes and do all the tricky pass-throughs. But they've done the heavy lifting, mm -hmm. um, and it works extremely well. I do have to mention that SSIS, or excuse me, FME has a new package called the SQL Server Spatial um, Data Loader Edition. Now, if any of you know FME, it's an extreme, it's the Swiss Army knife of, uh, of spatial. I mean, I can't live without it. Um, it is somewhat expensive. Um, I think something in the order of $5,000 uh, for a, a single user seat. Is that Mike actually purchased it relatively recently? Yeah. Can go north uh, of that? There's different size editions, like 8,000, closer to 9,000. Closer to 9,000, OK. So I pleaded with them to do something simple for us. One of the things that SQL Server is missing and is not likely ever to have is something known as spatial uh, projection transformation support. And all of you go, how could you not put that into SQL Server Spatial? Well, my argument, and bear in mind that I've done uh, spatial enablement of relational databases, this is my fourth time. Started with Illustra. Anybody know about Illustra? Illustra was the commercialization of Postgres, right? So Postgres took two paths. There was Postgres sitting at the University of California at Berkeley, and Postgres went into the public domain, and it got commercialized by the same guy, Mike Stonebreaker, who commercialized Ingress, Project Sequoia. So he went back and he did Postgres after Ingress post, and he was going to do a third database, but he never got around to it. What would he call it if he did the third database? Regress, of course. Um, so Postgres got, um, uh, uh, let's say, brought into commercialization as Illustra. Informix bought Illustra, and I moved to 
Informix, and we did the same thing over again. Those were called data blades. We had geodetic data blades and we had spatial data blades. And then Informix got bought by IBM. And so what did I do there? I did DB2 spatial and DB2 geodetic. And so I've done this now multiple times. And in all of those other past packages, we have put in spatial transformation and datum transformation support. But I'll give you an example. Esri's staff, to just keep up with all of the projection and datum transformation support in ArcGIS, is almost twice the size of my staff that does SQL Server Spatial. It's a lot of energy that goes into a very small area. So what we're going to do, but have not done it yet, is to provide a CLR framework so that you can put in your own favorite public domain or private, however you want to do it, data transformation engine. Something like Proj4, for instance. But we're not going to support that because it is an eclectic world that is unto itself. But if today you had to do projection transformation support, what would you use? Well. FME is a good choice, but as Steve pointed out, FME can cost, you know, eight, nine thousand dollars. How about a version of FME, the SQL Server Spatial Data Loader Edition, that costs US five hundred dollars? That's available today. What does it do? It takes CVS shape files, CSV shape files, and a few others, and supports the SQL Server Spatial uh, objects in SQL Server. So it allows you to load from shapefiles in a few other formats, pretty restricted. It also allows you to do all of the projection and datum transformation that uh, SAFE offers, which is, needless to say, a full, complete implementation. So that's my current recommendation and how to do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm bearing our soul and saying we are not going to support datum transformations, spatial uh, projection transformations. Here's how you do it today in a cost-effective way. OK. There's a very long-winded answer. Where yes, Dan. Pardon? Where do you get it at? You go to www.safe.com. Uh, if you do forward slash Microsoft, you can get there immediately, and you can um, uh, see their stuff. Incidentally, they're very generous, typically, with educational organizations. Uh, and if you plead good enough, they often will kick out uh, even year-long evaluation licenses. So uh, if, you, if you know how to, how to plead your case, uh, Dale Lutz is the uh, VP of Engineering. They're a great company to deal with, by the way, if you haven't ever uh, dealt with them. So they get my highest, highest marks. OK, um, some of the other interesting things that we've done, I'm actually going to shift forward here just a little bit. Where am I? OK, um, let's take a look here, for instance, on how we define objects. Um, on the plane, we can define a polygon, for instance, in any direction. In other words, the winding order of the polygon, whether it is counterclockwise or clockwise, we can figure it out in the plane. It doesn't matter to us. Oracle Spatial, on the other hand, how many people here have experience with Oracle Spatial? Somebody must. Oracle Spatial, spatial Objects, you must wind the objects in a counterclockwise direction. That's for the outer ring of the polygon. If you do an inner ring for the polygon, Lethoso for South Africa, you have to wind it the other way, clockwise in Oracle's um, uh, case. Now, it turns out that Oracle's method of doing this we have all adopted in the industry. In fact, even before Oracle did it, Informix did this with the um, geodetic data blade. And here's why. When you're on a closed surface, the order of winding of the polygons is very important. If you wind it in one way and then wind it in the other way, it means two different things. It means in this case, if you take a look down here on our orthographic uh, view, you notice that, and I'll use and I'm now forever going to call Dan's magnifier. You notice that in this case, the winding order down here is apparently counterclockwise. If you really get into details, there's no such thing as clockwise and counterclockwise on a closed surface. We actually use a better term, which we call the left foot rule. So if you walk the polygon, straddling it, and your left foot is on the inside, that is the winding order for the geodetic uh, polygons data type if you want that to be an interior ring. Your foot is on the inside. If you want that to be an exterior ring, 
then you would do it the opposite way. So in this case, you notice it goes one, two, three. That's the right foot rule, right? If I walk it from one to two, guess what? My, my foot is sitting to the outside, right? So it's the rest of the world. And this brings up an interesting piece. SQL Server now is the only database, and in fact, I can't even think of a GIS system that does this. We allow you to, to treat and deal with the Earth as a singular object. And how did we do that? We extended the OGC well-known text with a new keyword. Keyword is full globe. And when you say full globe, you mean the entire surface of the Earth. And so in this case, we now can deal with the rest of the Earth. In this case, it's a polygon specified by a reverse ring order. Now, if we go the other way, let's see, I think it was in my previous slide. You notice down here, the ring order is one, two, three, and that defines the ring to be a closed polygon of what we would call a small polygon, right? One that is a, a takes up less than a hemisphere of space on the Earth. So large and small, and we have ways of detecting this and ways of reorienting. We have new methods. One of them is called reorient object. You notice there's no ST in front of it? it means it is not an OGC standard method. So that's just a quick introduction to, um, uh, 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 to ring ordering. So on the plane, it doesn't matter. We can figure it out on the fly. On the ellipsoid, it is very, very important. And we use the same method that DB2 uses, that Postgres, PostGIS, with their new geodetic type uses, the same that Oracle Spatial uses, which is the left foot rule for geography. Spatial operations. So these are the spatial operations that we um, support. The ones with the asterisk down here um, are new to Denali. So we support a whole new series of aggregates. And so Dan can see them. We'll, that zoomed in too much, Dan. See what you did to me? And I also, all right, I'm not gonna be tricky yet. But we have a new series of aggregates down here. Union aggregate, collection aggregate, convex hull aggregate, and envelope aggregates. These are, have been oft asked for things. We currently do have them on our CodePlex site. And if how many of you know about the SQL Server Spatial Tools CodePlex site? Not enough. Dan does. Dan's getting the message. Um, but what we've done is we use the CodePlex site to incubate new concepts and new ideas, and then we typically take the winners of those incubations and move them into the next product. Now, here's something that's very exciting. All of the Denali features that we're talking about today these new aggregates and so on, they won't actually show up in SQL Server Spatial um, until the end of the year. But they will show up in SQL Azure before then. In fact, they're all slated to show up in SQL Azure in the June release of Azure. So the idea here is that Azure is going to have in a higher cadence. So instead of every three years for SQL Server, we're going to go to an every three to four months for SQL Azure. And this is exciting because we now are going to see many new features, things that you guys asked for, like OData support, support for <laughs> spatial in SSIS. Uh, what about link, entity data model, all the rest? We're a natural for all of that stuff, but you guys have to ask for it. The product teams internally, we really don't get a vote. Customers get a vote. And so if you guys want this stuff, pop up, if you don't see it there and connect, you everybody know about connect, right? Microsoft, uh, connect.microsoft.com, use it. I'm just curious, why doesn't uh, it support raster data? Are the images just too large? No, not at all. In fact, um, we do support raster data. What was, what, uh, uh, question for Dan Fay, what was the uh, largest uh, raster data uh, geospatial implementation on SQL Server uh, before Google did it, before um, Virtual Earth did it, it was called? Terra Server. Terra Server. And Terra Server had image support out of its kazoodle. Um, so it's how did still it? Running. Hmm? And it's still running. And it was all done on SQL Server 2000. 
Well, clearly, SQL Server 2008, which has much better blob support, for instance, uh, than that can do it. So the question is, when you talk about raster support, what do you really want in raster support, right? Do you want just the ability to hold a large image? Well, we can hold uh, up to two gigabytes per uh, per object, right? So you could have a uh, uh, var binary max uh, object to two gigabytes. That will hold, you know, a relatively decent image, right? So we're still debating as to what does it mean to hold rasters. Do we just want syntactic sugar? Do we just want programming assistance, you know, to instantiate a new type? But what methods, for instance, would we want? Um, so we're currently debating how we would do that because we think today we have all of the programming support for it, all the type and method support. Um, but questions, for instance, Oracle allows you to do rotation of, uh, of rasters, right? Well, isn't that really an ETL op uh, operation? It's just confusing to us as to which direction we would go. So if you have some ideas, it would be great. Well, does uh, FME support uh, spatial projections for the rasters then through SQL Server, is that? Yes, they do. Okay. Yep. So a lot of these things boil down to, is it really a process that we should bring internal to the database, or should this be held as an ETL uh, process and function? And it, the older I get, and I am getting older, uh, it means that I've rethought this very carefully, and I think there's an awful lot more to ETL than we've given credit for. So I'm really pressing for an ETL. Does that mean it's a perfect thing? I can think of scenarios where it would be extremely handy to have uh, projection transformation in the, the database. Um, it's actually not hard to add that in. And if you take a look at our CodePlex site, which is on my resources page at the end of the presentation, uh, you'll find our CodePlex site. And there, in fact, are some spatial data transformation methods, uh, including some projections. And there's even an affine uh, transform down there for all of you who like to do affine transforms. Um, so. Uh, it, this is kind of a, a work in progress here in terms of do we pile on and put everything, the kitchen sink, inside the database server, which we can, or do we try and segregate these into logical workflow items that are reasonable for the industry? So that's kind of where we are. Long, long answer to a short question. So any questions on this? Uh, Boolean operators, um, relational operator, constructions, numeric operators. There's many more than besides this, by the way. For, uh, for seismology, we typically measure distance as angular distance. Do you do that with your distance? Um... We do it internally, but we do not surface that um, externally. That's a very um, interesting idea. I hate to say this. It's not a popular way of, <laughs> <laughs> of doing it, but um, uh, that is interesting because we do support that internally. Hmm. You may be able to actually get access to that via our library. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, send me email, uh, ed.catabot.microsoft.com. I'll send it off to the library engineer, and we'll see if we can get an answer to that. Okay, yeah, that would be very useful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, here are just some geography um, uh, examples. Um, you can see how we construct these things. Uh, I typically write white papers. Anybody know how to find my blog? I'm, I'm spatial ed. Uh, and in fact, last night we did this around dinner, and we did it on Bing Mobile on my phone, and I was third listed when you did spatial ed. There were a couple of spatial educational systems that were higher ranked than I was. So I was very upset. Um, but I went back. But, hmm? well, I'm, I'm, top, I'm top on, not on Bing Mobile. I'm top if you go to regular Bing. So I'm a little confused how Bing Mobile ranks things versus how Bing ranks things. I didn't know there was a difference, Chris. There's no SQL mobile or something, right? Is there a mobile version of SQL? Mobile version of SQL? Yeah. Well, uh, yes. Why? Why are we asking? I uh, just because that would help you in the relevance on mobile. I'm just curious. Oh, okay. I can help you with the. I SEO think that was a that. dig at me. If I. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> this is Chris Pendleton, by the way, who is my counterpart over in the in the Bing Mobile side, and he's going to be giving a very interesting presentation here in a little bit. Um, so spatial ed, if you go spatial space ed, there's a bunch, a plethora of, of 
For instance, if you wanted to load GeoNames into SQL Server, I give you a complete tutorial, exhaustive, on how to do it from A to Z. If you wanted to, to uh, load in all the ANSS uh, seismic data for the world, I provide examples in there, talk about invalidity of spatial objects and how you can remind. Anyway, it's good reading if you want to put yourself to sleep. My wife occasionally looks at it and says, who in the dickens reads this stuff? <laughs> um, OK, I'm going to fly through this because I'm rapidly running out of time. Um, again, I just want to emphasize here that um, this is standard stuff. We are the first to do full globe um, spatial object support. We are now the first to support curves. These are radial curves on the ellipsoid. This has never been done before. Uh, it's an interesting thing. Who can think of an interesting example of what a curve on the ellipsoid might represent a very simple thing. Great circle. Mm, great circle. Uh, how about a line of latitude or a line of longitude? Not necessarily great circles. Great circles are, are typically, we don't represent them as curve objects. We actually call them something different than great circles. Great circles are the shortest distance on a sphere. And since we're not a sphere, we're an ellipsoidal object, technically the greatest, uh, so the, the Closest distance would be a geodesic. But geodesics are um, expansion series computations. And so they're very costly. And they also get very unstable at high latitudes. So we use a modification of this called the Great Elliptic Arc. And it is a high performance version of a great circle on the ellipsoid. But we don't, mo uh, we don't actually do that as a um, circular object. That would be. Um, a line of latitude. So for instance, we could do the torrid zone, right? Between the Tropic of Capricorn and Tropic of Cancer. We could define that with basically six points. OK? That's pretty cool at, at very high resolution. I mean, we're talking submillimetric measurement values um, of those particular arcs uh, on the ellipsoid. And incidentally, this is very important to understand. When we define an edge, a polygon edge between two vertices in geometry, it's a straight line. When we take that same edge in the geography type, that is a great <coughs> elliptic arc. It is not a straight line. So this is very important to understand, because this is correct geospatial computational algebra now that's going on. And so it's, um, if you intersect, for instance, a line between two points, on the geography, and you intersect it with another line between two points, it is not the obvious intersection of two straight lines. It's the intersection of two elliptic arcs. When you do a contains, or a within, or um, an intersects query, it is taking into account those edges are actually curved features on the ellipsoid. So this is very precise stuff. OK, let's fly through that. Um, some examples of valid and invalid data. How many of you have tried to put in invalid objects into SQL Server 2008 geography type? Has anybody tried to do that? An invalid object might be, for instance, a polygon that looks like a bow tie. Wouldn't go into SQL Server um, 2008 geography type. Very frustrating for people. What's wrong with my data? Or my favorite is, I've found a bug. Now, you haven't found a bug. You found a limitation on the server. The server said you must be OGC compliant on your objects. For Denali, we've relaxed that. So now we allow you to bring in invalid objects. So this is an example here, right up here, for instance, of an invalid object. That object has its polygon winding order incorrect. Which polygon winding order is incorrect? Using the magnifier. Here, if we look at that polygon, we notice the um, exterior ring is correctly ordered, right, with the left foot rule. And the interior ring also has a left foot rule winding order. So you really want that to be the whole. That's Lethoso, let's say. So what happens in SQL Server 2008? It rejects that. It says invalid object. Can't put it in. I get a, we found a bug in your server. Um, for 2008. In 11, or SQL Server Denali, we allow this now to be made valid. And we actually have 
a method called make valid. And that's always been in the geometry type. It is now in the geography type. And what do we do when we make it valid? We figure out what you want to do, and we correct it for you on the fly. And you notice it doesn't have an ST in front of it because it is not an OGC method. They, they haven't thought of this method. They talk about validity and invalidity. For instance, ST is valid is an OGC method. But they don't provide a make valid. Why? Because it's very difficult to figure out how to do it. And the OGC Standards Committee gave up before they wanted to work that hard. So here's another object right below here. And this goes to show you here's an overlapping polygon, right? What happens when we make this valid? We do that, all right? Things of this nature. So we are much more relaxed in Denali in terms of uh, object validity. And object validity is an interesting one. This is something we're also rethinking here carefully. Our ST methods, by definition, have to obey OGC rules. But we're introducing more and more non-ST methods that are more relaxed about this. If you bring in a, a GPS track, it's often what you, we will find tracebacks, right? So you're, you're doing GPS, GPS, point, 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 point. And then we'll find a, a traceback where somebody went under a tree and you got a bad GPS value. And it looks like it actually redrew over that same line and then on again. That's an invalid object according to OGC. You know, is that really necessary to be that precise? Well, we're re-debating that. So for our ST methods, we will always obey um, OGC. For our non-OGC methods, we're a bit more optimistic. OK. So this gives you an idea here of uh, some spatially enabled scenarios with full globe objects. Um, we couldn't hold a single time zone as a spatial object uh, in SQL Server 2008. You can now hold all the world time zones as uh, individual objects. And incidentally, you say, well, can't others do this? The answer is no. Postgres can't do this. Oracle Spatial can't do this. Um, in fact, uh, even my beloved uh, DB2 Geodetic cannot do this. Um, this is all unique stuff to SQL Server. So will you, will you use this often? Maybe not. But the fact of the matter is you will not find any singularities uh, such as international dateline, the poles, or just even in the size of the object with SQL Server. We can look at a few spatial queries. We actually talked about these a few minutes ago. Um, one of the ones that's interesting, though, is ST distance. Um, that's an indexed operation. In fact, uh, we use ST distance in preference to using buffers. Traditionally, in spatial operations, we would use a buffer in order to um, you know, choose all objects within some distance of, of another feature. It's actually much more efficient to use ST distance. That's indexed. You don't instantiate or spin up another spatial object in memory. Um, works like a charm. Nobody else indexes on um, ST distance. So it's a very powerful um, uh, approach to this. Uh, here are methods supported by the index. This, this um, presentation here is chock full of this level of detail here. So I'm not going to go through it all, and I can't because I only have two minutes left. Um, but this is something you can review at your leisure. Uh, here's a spatial join right here using ST intersects. Here's a nearest neighbor. So new to Denali is a special pattern that the query optimizer recognizes, <laughs> something that we could have used a few months ago, um, that allows us to actually do um, you know, select top end from by some distance. We have to put a special clause in. Again, remember, the query optimizer looks for patterns. This is a specific pattern it recognizes and says we're going to optimize and use the spatial um, uh, indexes and data types when we see this pattern. Spatial aggregates, we've chatted about those. Spatial index, I'm going to fly through this because we don't have time to talk about indexing, but suffice it to say there's some good stuff there for you. Uh, we have spatial histograms now available, so we actually have helper methods. I think it's right here. Helper methods to actually generate spatial histograms. Those histograms are, in fact, raster data. And uh, you can map and model this in um, Bing Maps. 
and you can do some interesting um, statistics to see how your spatial indexing um, strategy. And that brings up one last point that I'll leave you with. If you know our spatial indexing today, you're going to be very happy with our spatial indexing tomorrow because we've introduced a new self-tuning index called the auto index. So we have a geography auto um, uh, index and we have a geometry auto. And it's an eight level grid. So before it was a four level grid, now we're eight levels. And this can give extreme performance plus it also offers the ability to not have to um, come up with the high, 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 medium, medium, high, low, medium combinations in terms of cell orientation at the different levels. We figure all of that out for you. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. It's 11 o'clock. We probably have time for a very limited number of questions. Yes. <coughs> Um, you have two questions. One is about the visualization. You touched on that on this slide. So you're seeing that uh, the beam map could be used to visualize the data from SQL uh, Spatial, SQL Server. Uh, do you plan to support other visualization platforms like WWT? Um, do we plan on supporting other platforms like WWT? WWT, and I'm going to be honest with you, and this is exactly what I tell Dan and Jonathan and Yan, is it makes me cry. <laughs> because I want to have SQL Server rendered in that environment. SQL Server is a wonderful thing, but sexy it is not, right? It's a back-end database and it's a real workhorse. Here is the world's most beautiful visualization platform, and I'm this, this, this close from, from this. So, again, put your recommendations in, because if we're lucky, Jonathan and Dan we will, will listen, right? And maybe the SSIS people will listen and the OData people will listen and we'll end up with spatial being ubiquitous everywhere. But I agree with you. Um, that is something that we're looking at actively. And, um, and now that I've, I, I purposely have not been looking at WWT because I was afraid it was becoming as beautiful as I thought. And, and it, it hurts me to my soul that my data cannot be presented in that beautiful venue. Is that, is that enough? Okay, Jonathan. Uh, um, this is, the, what do you mean it can't be? We're not integrated in your browser, but the, the space between it, especially you know, right now, you can, you know, we do a lot of work with uh, like Excel, connecting up to Excel data and linking that live, refreshing queries and, and, and such. And uh, it, you know, as, as part of an ecosystem, uh, we don't have direct SQL straight to uh, Worldwide Telescope, but uh, with Excel, uh, with Excel in between or with your own application logic in between, it works very well. So uh, so we just need to do that uh, mediation development to link them. Uh, so, I mean, if you want a, a something out of the box, you can basically uh, set up the Excel, uh, set up a SQL connection that uh, uh, drops it into Excel and then bind that Excel uh, uh, those Excel uh, uh, tables uh, into Worldwide Telescope layer. And then as you update your query in, in Excel, it will automatically show up in, in uh, Worldwide Telescope. Yeah, thank so you can do that right now today. Yep, that's true, and, and, it, and it does work. Um, but Including I do want to well point out text and I do want to point out that we can overload a, um, a WKT value can overload a Excel cell in instance. That's great. Uh, my second question is about the VGI part, uh, volunteer geographic information. Uh, a lot of people were talking about, for example, let's digitize something on the B maps, and I would love to push that back to the SQL Spatial or SQL Server database. Has that already been supported? Or? Actually, there are blog posts by Johannes Kiebeck uh, and others in which they actually detail how you can actually digitize on a Bing canvas and capture that and push it into SQL Server Spatial. So if you're good enough with queries, I remember it's a couple of years old now, in fact. And, and that can be viewed by everyone who's using BMAPs or just restricted? No. I need to use of your application that have access okay. to your SQL Spatial instance. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Data Connector okay. does that. It allows you to digitize polygons. Data Connector allows you to do that. You can digitize polygons. And it, they're just query polygons, but you could save those polygons as a, another record in the database as well if you wanted to show them to another user of your application. That's not users of 
Bing Maps or Bing in general, it's just your application. But once you've instantiated that in, um, uh, in SQL, it's now available to anybody who has access to that SQL table. Yeah, to that SQL table. Yeah. So, um, Ad is going to be around still. Um, do your best that you catch up with him and then throw your question to him. Um, we're going to take a group picture.